Welcome everyone on this uh, cold evening in Melbourne. It's nice to have all of you joining with us for our live event on Israel. We're hoping uh, tonight to not quite be like the ABC, but we're going to run a Q&A um, similar to the ABC type event. And we're going to be inviting some panelists from our Canterbury community that are able to join with us tonight through uh, Zoom. Uh, we were hoping to do this live together, but uh, restrictions are keeping us from being able to do that. So we're joining you uh, via live uh, Zoom from our houses. And um, it is highly relevant, this topic today, um, as has happened in the last week. We've had the governmental change in Israel that you might have seen on the news, and that followed the escalated conflicts with the Palestinians um, featuring both heavily in the news coverage. And this is a highly relevant topic to today, and we're hoping that in response to our presentation from last Sunday, we can kick some questions around today. And I would like to introduce all of our panelists now that we've invited into this Q&A. First, um, on my, my bottom left, we have um, Sid Levette. Um, he was our presenter last Sunday night. He's now retired from working life in the major corporates. And uh, he has been a lifelong member of our community at Canterbury. And Sid is widely traveled with a particular interest in Bible prophecy on which he has spoken and written many articles that I, I can attest to. Um, also, we have with us tonight, Shannon Richards. Uh, Shannon Richards is a busy mom of three. Um, she's an office manager of a psych practice who loves to delve into Bible archaeology and scriptural studies, as well as um, conservation projects. And she's particularly interested in architecture. Also joining us uh, is Josh Wallace. Um, Josh owns a timber manufacturing business and spends most of his time these days trying to get supply. <laughs> and he is a, has a longstanding interest, um, like the others, in understanding and teaching scripture. And he has been privileged to do this uh, both in India and the Philippines. And lastly, but not leastly, Natasha Kirkwood. Um, Tash is a health professional background in physiotherapy. And Tash and her family, they live high up in uh, the beautiful but recently storm-battered Mount Dandenong, where she comes to us tonight, courtesy of a backup generator. So Tash, thank you for joining us uh, tonight. And lastly, myself, uh, I'm your moderator tonight. Um, I'm the CEO of an energy management engineering firm. Uh, sorry about that, Tash. Um, we couldn't, couldn't quite make it work for you. But uh, I also have a great interest in biblical teaching and apologetics in my personal background in the New York City area. Um, and I spent a lot of time with the Jewish community there. And like some of the others on the panel, I have also visited Israel. And I have uh, firsthand experience with some of these things because I spent a lot of time in the West Bank at a settler camp, Kibbutz. And I remember hearing guns firing up the hills and uh, went as close as I could to the Gaza Strip and literally seeing rockets uh, going above me overhead. So um, the reality of this topic is intense. And uh, I remember seeing bullet holes in walls with ammunition shells on the Golan Heights. And for me, uh, as was the others that have been to Israel, like me, uh, walking in that land, uh, this is not just a story from far away in another time. This is real today. And, uh, and as we're seeing it on the news, it continues. We have a diverse panel tonight, and um, we're looking forward to some good discussion. Now, for some transparency for you as audience members um, and to manage expectations, perhaps, um, while we are varied in our perspective and different facets on the topic, which will make this an interesting discussion, our panelists are not from opposing sides for debate, as we sometimes see on Q&A, but rather, as all Christians from our Canterbury community, we believe that the Bible is the word of God, and we can expect answers tonight will probably be framed in that context. And we want to say that whether the Bible can be legitimately trusted as an authoritative source is a worthy question, and we will look to address that um, on other events that we host. Um, in response to Sid's presented content, we've had a list of about 25 questions submitted, either personal questions from people or secondhand views passed on to be request uh, at the request of others, on behalf of others. So as many of the questions were getting at very similar kinds of ideas, for the purpose of tonight's Q&A, I have condensed them down to four general headings 
each containing two questions. Now, I will be asking these eight questions to the members of our panel, but to ensure that all voices are heard as a facilitator, I'm going to ask two panelists per question explicitly, and then should any other panelists have something to add, they may do so at that time. But I will be limiting each question to five minutes total. Now, welcome our panel. Uh, hopefully, we'll see all of our panelists here next to each other. All right, so welcome Tash, Sid, Josh, and Shannon to the panel tonight. Our first general topic is under the general theme, understanding Israel as a nation and Zionism and Judaism, which was brought up in Sid's presentation. For our first question, I'd like to start with Sid, and I'll just ask him to unmute himself, as well as Shannon. I'd like to toss this question to the two of you. The first question being, why did God choose Israel of all nations to be custodians of his word? And what did they do to show this today? I'll start off with Sid. Right. Thank you, James. And uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. We hope that we can deal with uh, explaining some of these uh, questions to you. Uh, admittedly, as James has said, they're going to be fairly tight answers, so we can't go into all the ins and outs, but that can be followed up later by email, as James will explain later. Uh, now, with this question, we need to firstly go back some 4,000 years uh, when God wanted effectively a faithful person to be the forerunner of a nation that would be given the knowledge of God and also a code for appropriate living. And this was for the purpose of retaining a knowledge of God in the world, as was already apparent by that time that people were rapidly losing an understanding of the instructions that God had, which are not necessarily recorded for us, but it's quite apparent there were records long before that of how they should respond. Now, God wanted to retain this evidence of his existence and the background of it all, and he found such a person in Abraham who was living in an area to the north of Israel, and in brief, he was given a promise that a great nation would come from him, that that nation would ultimately give him the land of Israel, roughly as we see it now, plus some other areas further north, and most importantly, that from that line of people would descend Jesus Christ through whom all can be saved. So it takes us beyond Israel into a much broader concept. Now, God said as he formed this nation that he wasn't doing it because Every individual in it was thoroughly righteous and going to follow him exactly. He was well aware of that. He wanted these people, as a special people, retaining a knowledge of him as a witness to the world. And that has surely happened, and that special knowledge and the special laws they followed have kept them quite clearly as a, as a separate people through the centuries. Now, unfortunately, so many of these people uh, fell away and did not follow him his ways, and various punishments came upon them over the centuries. It came to a head some 2,000 years after the time of Abraham when they rejected Jesus Christ as their Messiah and they received the ultimate punishment then of being rejected, thrown out of their land by the Romans in AD 70. So a huge issue that set up all the current issues with them being spread around the world. Now, we can't go through all that, of course, and we can just really jump from there to say that the coming of Jesus at that time opened the way for all people to participate in God's plan for the earth. And the return of Israel to their land is solid and very powerful evidence of God being with them and that other issues and prophecies in the Bible will likewise have come to fruition in that same way. So I'll leave it at that point and we can move across to allow Shannon to add to some to that question. Yeah, Shannon, uh, over, over to you for some comments, please. Thanks, James. Sid, what you said um, was spot on, that in the modern times, the uh, event of the regathering of the Jews in 1948 was and is still a really big deal. Really, that is probably the most significant thing we have in modern times as Israel being a witness to us. But there's a couple of other things that are really worth looking at. One of them is the fact that the people in Israel, the Jews, I'm talking about the Jews, many of them are still very faithful. And when you think about the fact that they've been wandering around the earth, pretty much the globe, for about 1,800 years, oppressed, killed, scattered, broken, and they've come back to this land, regathered, 
tried to pull themselves together and work together, and yet there's still many that are faithful. I think that's pretty impressive. In fact, at the moment that they're suggesting is about 40% of the Jewish population still believe in the Old Testament and try and serve their God. And I think that is quite impressive after such a long period of time. The other thing I think would be worth mentioning is about the incredible influence that the Jews have on a worldwide scale. Some of these, some of uh, you would know this, but the Jewish influence on a worldwide scale is unbelievable considering they are a tiny nation. And when I say a tiny nation, you can fit 10 Israels into Victoria. So it's a really small nation. And yet from a world point of view, they have a massive influence. And I'm talking about they essentially run Hollywood. So they influence pop culture in a massive way. Hollywood is Jewish. Then Wall Street and New York finances and things like that, the influence is enormous. And because of that, we might think it's not that important, but it enormously shapes politics and it shapes and changes what happens in Israel um, on a constant basis, whether it's treaties or something like that, is influenced through Wall Street and the US voting power. So those things are quite interesting that even though they're not prophesied events, we can see God's hand witnessing and moving and shaping this tiny nation uh, throughout all the world events which are pointing forth to things to come. So I think that's something we can look forward to um, and watch on a um, almost weekly basis. So, uh, so James, I think I'll hand that back to you because I think that pretty much sums up our modern in, the modern um, witness of Israel. Okay, well, what I'd like to do is uh, these, these issues are fairly complicated, and um, there was another aspect to these kinds of questions that came in, and that certainly leads on to question number two, um, which things got a little bit more challenging uh, to answer, and it's very relevant to today. And this time I'm going to toss over to Tash and Josh. So uh, this is a combination of a couple of different questions that had come in, um, and it's the topic generally is Zionism seems to be discriminatory towards other ethnicities, especially the Palestinians. How can this be godly? It's hard to know who is right and wrong in the media debates. Whose land is it? And how far back does one have to go to determine this? Let's, um, let's start off with Tash. Tash? Well, contemporary Zionism certainly seems to have a discriminatory flavour to it, to the extent that it was originally about having and now it's about developing and protecting a safe place for specifically Jewish people. In some ways, perhaps there's an analogy to be had with our current situation in a global pandemic where a country such as Australia is quite unapologetic about looking to bring back and safeguard people from around the world who happen to hold a um, Australian citizenship. The presentation has, which um, Sid gave us, has outlined how the Bible is very clear that he would bring the Jews who have been who'd been exiled for nearly two thousand years back to the land that he had promised to Abraham. And so, Zionism in that regard is aligned with God's promises. And those promises, as um, Shannon mentioned earlier, date back 4,000 odd years. There's one pertinent prophecy that I'd like to share with you all, and that's from uh, the book of Amos, chapter nine, just two verses. Uh, and that says, I will bring my exiled people of Israel back from distant lands, and they will rebuild their cities and live in them again. They will plant vineyards and gardens. They will eat their crops and drink their wine. I will firmly plant them there in their own land. They will never again be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. But on the flip side, any oppression by Israel as the current military strongman of the region against the Palestinian people is certainly not godly from a Christian perspective. 
and nor is it any way acceptable from a humanitarian perspective. And every instance of oppression which is served up by Israel simply ferments that awful cycle of violence and strife. And then this plays out in the media um, who view the situation typically through the lens of the military underdog, which is the Palestinian people. Thanks for that, Tash. There's, uh, I'm sure there's, there's sort of another side to some of this stuff, another perspective. And for that, I'd like to go over maybe to Josh to expand on maybe what Tash said. And Yeah, thanks, James. And, um, and thanks, Tash, too. Um, I guess just to focus on one element of that question, which uh, focused on um, the question of whose land is it and how far back does one go to determine this? Um, if we accept the, uh, the preposition which you put forward at the beginning, James, that the, the scriptures or the Bible is uh, the revealed word of God, then there's actually a really clear answer to this. Um, I've got a uh, particular passage in mind at the moment in the book of Ezekiel where God is actually quite passionate, quite emphatic, where he says, this, this land is my land. He repeats it several times in the passage. It's actually quite an interesting passage to read. It's my land, he says. Um, and, and I suppose if you accept that, then in reality it becomes his prerogative to, to give it and to take it as, as he wills. Um, uh, Sid alluded to it a little bit earlier that prior to even Israel as a, as a group of tribes coming into that land, there was a, a group of people a confederate group of Canaanitish tribes which were in that land even before that. And um, the Bible's clear, though it doesn't give us a lot of information, that God was engaged with these people in some way and um, had communicated to them. Uh, and it makes it clear that they were being evicted from the land for their wickedness, for the fact that they had broken his commandments. Uh, and that's what gave way to... Uh, uh, Abraham and his descendants then coming in and taking that land. Um, but then, of course, they were evicted on the same basis for, for their wickedness. And so we've seen the land over the years change hands, so to speak, time and time again. And in Scripture, it's often depicted as being at the behest of God and for his purposes and for his will. Of course, the, the key thing and the exciting thing is that as his land, he's ultimately promised it to his son. He's promised it to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the scriptures are really clear that he's going to return. He's going to be given the land as his inheritance. And he's going to actually reign from the center of that land in Jerusalem uh, on the throne of David. Well, thanks for that, Josh. Uh, both for Tash and Josh um, and Sid and Shannon, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to, for time, move on to uh, the next major section. And all these sections, I think we're probably going to come back to some of the ideas that have already been started to be covered. Um, the next kind of group of questions that we've got is probably related to that, but maybe putting Israel on, uh, on the other side of the coin. And that is God's revealed will and plan with Israel across time. And the first question uh, takes us back to a very difficult time in history. Um, and I'd like for this one, I'd like to go probably back to Tash and then maybe to Sid on this one as well. Um, the question is really about the Holocaust. Um, the Holocaust was no doubt one of the darkest moments in modern history. Why would God allow this to happen to his people and the result of that seems like God then deliberately chose to place Israel right in the middle of the Arab world, which seems to be a recipe for disaster. Um, now, this, this was presented in uh, Sid's talk. So, of course, we'll go to Tash first. And because Sid addressed this in his talk, we'll finish with Sid. Tash, why don't we go over to you first for the first part of this question. Okay. So I'm going to focus my thoughts on the, that initial part of the question, which relates to the Holocaust and the why did God allow the Holocaust to happen to his people is um, a very hard and very perplexing question. There's no doubt about it. The depth of the Jewish integration into Europe in the lead up to World War II 
is really important to understand. It explains why only a small number of Jews from Europe had taken the opportunity to uproot and to go to the land of Israel, even though it had been open for, to immigrate for them to immigrate to um, since the end of World War I, courtesy of the Balfour Declaration and the British Mandate. I mean, if you were a well-connected, um, successful doctor, musician, uh, dentist, business owner, craftsman, living in sophisticated Prague, Vienna, Berlin, why would you be tempted to pack up and leave everything and go and live in what was an unknown backwater, no matter how big the legend of the land might have been. The Zionist movement had already provided an incentive to relocate and there were certainly warning signs in Europe that it was becoming increasingly inhospitable for Jews to live there. But it was always going to take a seismic event to move the type and the numbers of people that were required for new nation building. Ask yourself, what would it take for you to be uprooted from your life in cosmopolitan Melbourne and be transported to somewhere, not, not Queensland, that would be quite easy to do right now, but to somewhere akin to the Wild West? From our vantage point in history, we now know that the impetus for that was the unspeakable and systematic atrocities of the Nazi regime and the Holocaust, which effectively emptied Europe of Jews. It turned people who had previously considered themselves to be um, German, Austrian, Italian, French, and it made them Jewish. They were made to wear the yellow star of David. They were separated. They were labelled. They were stamped. They were tattooed. They were forever marked as being Jewish. And the survivors of that were the ones who flooded to, back to Israel at the end of World War II. It's interesting that Theodore Herzl in the late 1800s had visions of the Jews nation building on the foundation of their own riches and their own abilities. The League of Nations, which was later replaced by the United Nations, had intentions of two separate states living side by side and an internationally controlled Jerusalem. Now that is far from what transpired. And meanwhile, the state of Israel appears to have been granted success pretty much ever since. Well, thanks for that. Uh, Tash, Sid, uh, would you like to add something to that question? Yes, uh, as uh, Natasha has mentioned, this is uh, one of the big challenging ones and it's a big topic and clearly challenging to cover in the few minutes we have. But we'll do our best to raise some points on it, as Tash already has there. Uh, and, of course, it, it might raise further questions, which we can uh, deal with separately later, of course. Now, it's apparent the Holocaust was huge, but as has been mentioned, it had to be to make the remaining Jews realise there was no future for them in Europe. A minor uprising or even a reasonably severe one would not have got that point through. Uh, as terrible as it was, it's still the fact that the Jews had been persecuted at terrible levels for centuries. And, of course, that itself was in accordance with God's word. He said that would happen because they didn't always do what he wanted them to do. Uh, for example, persecution in the late 1800s in Russia was absolutely terrible, affecting thousands, but not, of course, in the Holocaust numbers. And uh, individually, of course, people within those events suffered just as much as those in the Holocaust. So the, the problem and the persecution really goes back uh, quite some centuries. And that, of course, did start a lot of people, particularly in Russia, to start thinking about getting some movement to... Um, generate this interest in moving back to Israel, or Israel as we call it now. Uh, and it's Herzl actually who picks up on that view and articulates it and brings it into a lot more focus. Now, the other thing we should note here, and this is where it gets uh, into complex areas of getting our mind around the, the, the works of God and his right to do what he wants as the creator. Now, God clearly does not deliberately make people attack Jews, 
that mankind was created with a free will and many use it to hate Jews as well as doing other terrible things as we see virtually every night on the news. You, you do a global spin around and see what's going on. It's absolutely appalling, isn't it? And God allows people to have their own way sometimes to bring about outcomes he needs, as in the case of Israel. But other than that, it's a period of time has been allowed for mankind to do this until God's judgment comes upon them. And in particular, nations that have afflicted the Jews will suffer in the end, as had occurred during their time in the land before they were dispersed. And so, as it means, out of the Holocaust arose the nation of Israel, a huge event, and in so doing provided proof of all the numerous prophecies through the Bible that that would ultimately occur, that they would be brought back from this myriad of countries they were in uh, back into that land. Now, we could also mention uh, there's numerous little events behind these things which you can't find a particular prophecy verse for, but they clearly fit into the overall pattern uh, and you can see that God was behind it. And the return to the land was not solely caused by the Nazis because hatred of the Jews was widespread. And in some cases, that was caused by the success of the Jews, uh, which has been mentioned. Uh, they became academics and leaders in many professions to the extent they actually dominated many of the professions of Europe. And again, God was behind that. And if we get into the nitty gritties, it seems that he raised up Napoleon, firstly, to restructure Europe, to have an impact upon the mainstream church, and to introduce these laws of emancipation that allowed all people, including Jews, the right to education. And they took to that in a really big way and ended up going from the mid 1800s of being tinkers, tailors, and farm labourers to virtually running the professions of Europe. And, and as uh, Shannon mentioned in, in response to an earlier question, that dominance applies in many ways right through in the current era. Uh, so we can see in these things the challenges in getting our mind around it, but it had to be a huge event and it brought about the nation of Israel and that's the, the situation we've faced in seeing these prophecies fulfilled. Thank you. I'll leave it at that. No worries. Th th thanks. Thanks for that. Um, and I know uh, many of the questions that came in uh, were in and around this topic. And there's there's absolutely every reason that we should continue to have some of that discussion um, af afterwards. Now, I'm um, just uh, for making up a little bit of time here uh, in our for our fourth question certainly kind of falls out of that question of recent times and looks back um, at this sort of pattern of events over history. Um, and the fourth question, uh, this time I'll toss back to Josh uh, and Shannon. We might just begin with Shannon. The question um, is, Israel has had both prosperity and conflict with its surrounding nations down through time, and it is a challenging history. Is the Bible suggesting that this process was all part of God's master plan? And if so, what does that say about God's works with people today? So that's a combination of a couple of different flavors of question. Um, why don't we start off with maybe any aspects of that, Shannon, um, that you'd like to say? And I'll just ask you to come off of mute. Okay, I'm off mute. Thank you. Um, look, James, a lot of that, that question you've just posed there, um, you know, if you think about it with what Natasha said and Sid said, it, it fits in quite nicely about the way God works with this nation of Israel. You think about what he did with the Holocaust. He created that situation to cause a direct result for the Jews. Throughout history, uh, the nation of Israel has gone through many ups and downs. I mean, you only have to look at the Old Testament to see how thick it is, and most of it is about the history of Israel, their failures, their successes, their being carted off, they're coming back, God forgiving them and then telling them they should behave, then them drifting off again. You think, well, why? Why are there so many times in the Old Testament that there's this constant backwards and forwards with God? And, look, you have to read between the lines because God doesn't spell it out exactly. But basically my view is that it is teaching Israel the character of God. And God wants us to believe in him for a reason, not just because we have to. And by God seeing, uh, sorry, Israel seeing the way God deals with them, the way he forgives them, the way he sends them off when they're being bad in our, ter in their, our terms, 
that they learn God's compassion, his loyalty and his faithfulness. And hopefully then they'll want to choose to obey. And I'll give an example. One of the times of the first exile uh, when Babylon, uh, they got carted off to Babylon in 586 BC. The reason they got carted off was because they were looking elsewhere. They loved all the idols from all the neighbouring places. They couldn't get enough of them. And no matter how much God sent the prophets to tell them to behave and pull themselves in and follow him, they just kept on drifting off. It was just exciting and new. And so God said, enough is enough. Just like a father tells his kid, you know, I've, I've warned you enough times. It's time out. And God basically did the same with Israel. He said, I've warned you enough times and I'm sending you off. And he sent them off in a big way. You know, they had shaved heads. They were put in chains, the ones that were left and weren't killed, and carted all the way over to Babylon for for a period of time. And then when they returned, they basically never after that served or tried to worship idols. That was it. The rest of history, they learnt their lesson. And I think we can look back at examples like that and see that even though it seems hard at the time, that the first exile was really tough and they came back to Jerusalem, broken Jerusalem, you know, um, you know, really, really broken. They were poor and they were struggling, but they learnt how to serve God in the right way through that experience. And basically that is the story of the Old Testament. It's a story of blessings and cursings to try and help bring them closer to him. And um, when we look into the future, obviously he's going to do more of that. Um, I thought I'd just read a little verse, which I think sums it up quite nicely, about what is going to happen in the future and how God is going to humble Israel. So on that day when all the nations of the earth are gathered against her, I'll make Jerusalem an immovable rock for all the nations. Then the Lord will go out and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. Now that sounds like a fairly dramatic event that the whole, many of the nations surrounding Israel are going to come down and attack Israel and God will stand up for them and he will be their king, he will be their saviour and they will see that and hopefully be humbled and recognised but who he actually is because obviously at the moment they don't accept Jesus as the Messiah. Mm. And then after that, which is another favourite verse of mine, God says that Israel will be given a new heart. I'll remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and I'll put a new spirit in you. And I think that really shows where God's heading with Israel with all of these events and it's something that we can look forward to. So I'll hand it back to you, James. Thanks for that, Shannon. Interestingly enough, as the story I told in the beginning, when uh, when I stayed on a kibbutz in the West Bank, I uh, stayed with some settler Jews looking looking yeah. down on the on the valleys. And when I asked, uh, we asked them about the interpretation of what God has done. He, uh, in his best Jewish accent that I could make, he said, "This is how all parents deal with their children. We need it. He loves us, and we're committed." And it, it, this, <laughs> it was amazing to hear him. I'm thinking, okay, what, what wise words. Uh, it was an amazing perspective that he had uh, on looking back on their past. He said, this is our people's way. You look at our history. Look at our past. And he held up his Bible in front of me. Um, Josh, anything to add uh, Anything to add to that, that question? Yeah, look, um, look, it's fair to say, isn't it, that the, the relationship between Israel and the nations um, has been fraught. As, as you've highlighted and as Shannon has indicated. But um, I would argue that ultimately it was intended to be a, a positive impact that Israel had on the nations. And, uh, and, and I would argue that ultimately it has been uh, and will be. And the reason for that is this, is because, um, I mean, Sid alluded to uh, Abraham, the father, the patriarch of the nation Israel at the beginning. And one of the notable things that God promised to Abraham was that through a special descendant that would come in his family line, there would come a blessing. There would come a, become this particular gift from God to all nations of the world. Now, 
that gift, that special descendant from the line of Abraham was the Jewish man, Jesus of Nazareth. He was God's gift to the world. And we could argue whether or not the world has truly appreciated the nature of that gift, but it remains the fact that in the Western world, twice a year, the world stops and says, what a gift, <laughs> doesn't it? I mean, at Easter and at Christmas. Um, but why, why is it a gift? Why is it a blessing to all nations? Well, it's because Jesus, this Jewish man that God gave us, opened the way for each one of us to be saved from sin and death. Uh, because through faith in Jesus, our sins can be forgiven and we can be resurrected from the dead and given eternal life just like he was. So this this great drama, really, that's been unfolded through God's work with Israel as a nation has a direct blessing and an impact for each one of us from all sorts of nations. We, we have the opportunity, says Scripture, to, to share in the blessing of what was promised to the patriarchal father of the nation of Israel. So, and as, as Shannon's indicated, that's, that's still got a ways to play out for the actual nation itself, Israel itself is going to be going to be saved and actually caught up in that whole um, joyful blessing as well in the end when she recognizes her Messiah. Um, but yeah, I think there's that. That's the flip side to Israel's um, uh, relationship, unfolding relationship with the nations over time. All right, well, um, why don't we move on to our third uh, section? These will be probably shorter answers. They'll have to be for time, so keep your answers short and punchy here. The next section of questions is a little bit more about the history that Sid presented in his talk. Um, and I'll, I'll ask all four of you these, uh, these questions, but I might start off with Tash for this one. Um, this came up in Sid's talk. Um, David Ben-Gurion, he was appointed by God? Or was this Jewish state a purely secular activity? Kind of related to one of the questions from before. Um, did Britain's declaration get made because of what the Bible said or in light of it? How do we know this wasn't engineered to look like divine intervention? Um, there was a few questions combined into one there. Um, Tash, why don't we go to you and then we'll go to Sid. Uh... Right. So what was clear in the presentation that we watched is that the return of the Jews to Israel happened gradually and over an extended period of time. It didn't magically happen because of any one event or any one declaration and um, certainly not because of any single individual such as Theodore Herzl or um, David Ben-Gurion. Looking back at history, the pre-World War I pogroms, which was the focus violence towards Jews in Russia. That was the catalyst for the mass immigration of Jews into Europe and particularly into Germany. And that, that in time fermented that, anti, that ingrained um, anti-Semitic racism. Sid's presentation referred to the Belfour Declaration of um, November 1917 towards the end of World War I. And it was stated that this declaration made by the British had a combination of influences behind it, political, military and religious. Now, that combination of influences, including religious influence, is a pretty fair assessment when it comes to thinking about the Balfour Declaration. But what happened next includes the Great Depression, which of course affected Germany uh, terribly, um, the rise of the Nazi regime, World War II, and the related Jewish Holocaust. This is what it actually took for the required highly successful and integrated Jewish citizens of European countries to eventually flee en masse as refugees to Israel with nothing. So God uses people and events to fulfil his plan regardless of whether those people have faith or a complete absence of faith. People can be used as instruments of God but in themselves be completely ungodly. There would certainly have been individuals who 
wanted to see a state of Israel come into existence for religious um, and fulfilment of Bible prophecy reasons. But as for engineering all of those various seismic world-changing events, that takes any potential behind-the-scenes orchest orchestration um, way out of the ballpark of what's reasonable or even comprehensible for a leader or a group of leaders to coordinate. And that rather speaks to me simply of divine intervention. Sid, something to add to that? Yes, thanks there, Natasha. Uh, that, that's covered it quite well. It's got to mention with Ben Gurion, as we know, he was called the founding father of Israel and he would regularly quote from the Bible, which gave the impression he was religious, but he actually wasn't. It was more of a cultural thing. Uh, he was, however, committed to the Zionist cause and he worked tirelessly to develop that and went on to become the first president of Israel and was the man who announced the foundation of the, the state on the 14th of May, 1948. What it establishes, as, as has been mentioned there, that God can use non-believers to bring about his purpose and we should not think anything strange with that because they can be utilised. And in this case, they all work towards re-establishing Israel uh, and they had the drive and the ability to see things through and God would utilise special skills for that. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll leave the Ben-Gurion part of that. Uh, in the, the Balfour Declaration, this is a, a huge background to this and I'll constrain myself and really try and keep this tight. Uh, this is one that lends yeah. itself to a 40-minute talk. So uh, rein me in, uh, James. <laughs> but, right. uh, well, we could certainly refer people to your talk, but if you want to add... Well, uh, we'll um, just cutting to the chase, um, a lot of fascinating background. I, I have met people who say, well-read people, who quite honestly say they believe this was self-fulfilling, that the Jews and, and the Brits all sort of worked this out and self-fulfilled it, which is crazy stuff because... Um, for example, many Christian believers were found in the war cabinet of all things, quite quite bizarre, and they felt compelled to assist the Jews to return because they believed that it would facilitate the return of Christ, and the, the background of that is intriguing. We'll keep out of it, though. The other thing was Britain was short on munitions and struggling on the Western Front, and up Bob's chain Wiseman, who just... I'll we'll just use the word just happened, so to speak, to invent a method of making acetone by fermentation and he saves Britain. The munition production escalates markedly. They beef up the uh, armaments attacks on the Western Front and get on top of the war effort. It then just happened that Wiseman was the head of UK Zionist movement and Britain therefore owes him a big favour. He just happens to request support for a homeland for the Jews in Palestine. So you can see that massive links and all this background that the hand of God was moving people and events to bring this about. Uh, there were also political and military issues tied up in the Balfour Declaration. Uh, the military part did come to a success in the end, as they did get on top of World War I, but the political part didn't work. It's the money, the religious part that actually came through, although it's couched in political terms, and uh, politically they were had issued it with a view of uh, convincing the hoping that the Russian Jews would help keep Russia in the war and that the American Jews would bring America into the war. Well, the latter part worked and the first one failed because Russia left World War I after the revolution. So those parts of the, the British approach didn't actually work. It's also been criticised as being British imperialism, but that is not solely the case. So there was a religious backing as well and it's not commonly known, but the declaration was not released until that had the approval of President uh, Woodrow Wilson of the United States, and he was opposed to British imperialism but supported this because he thought it was the right way to go, and he also had a religious view on it as well, that we ought to help these people. So a, a lot of background, which I think I'll sum up by saying, when you look at the detail, the hand of God had to be behind this because there's no way that mankind could strip that one. Thank you. I'll leave it at that. Right on that um, on that same theme, just about religion. Um, Tash, you mentioned it a little bit. Um, religion, religiosity, seems to be a large part of the conflicts that we are seeing happen in Israel, as well as some political things. Um, Sid, you mentioned in your talk uh, the catastrophe. 
um, that is how the Arabs refer to the establishment of Israel. And as was presented, the destruction of Israel is fundamental to many of the Islamic extreme fundamental beliefs to be acted upon as part of existing. That's what it means to be alive, is to destroy Israel. Mm. Um, calling it the catastrophe. It's, it's uh, their formation in the first place. Um, there's a bit of a general question that kind of came through for a few, and I'm just going to put it this way. Um, religion seems to be the cause of the majority of world conflicts. Why would God choose to use war to accomplish his purpose? Let's go to Josh with that question first. Yeah, look, um, look, there's a few elements to, to that question. It's, it's true. It's fair to say that um, uh, religion has been a cause of contention, I think, down through history. Uh, probably a bit of a stretch to argue that it's uh, been the cause of the majority of the world's conflicts. I think that's a notion that could be challenged, but certainly a flashpoint. Um, in reference to the, uh, the Arabs referring to uh, Israel becoming a nation as, as a catastrophe in terms of the effects that it's had upon them, probably not a lot of point in downplaying uh, the suffering that people experience on any side of a conflict experience like that. So I've got no doubt that that's an apt term for a lot of individual Arabs' experience as a result of, uh, of what's what's occurred there. Um, as Tash has done a great job demonstrating, um, the Israelites were fleeing their own catastrophe, weren't they? Um, and seeking a safe harbour um, and, and a land that they could call their own. Um, I think it is true to say that the destruction of Israel is uh, harboured as a as an ambition and a desire on the part of uh, many. Um, I think it's a bit of an unwise position to, to hold in relation to Israel, and the reason being, like we've highlighted earlier, um, God's blessing to all nations is going to come through his work with that nation, and it has done. Um, and, and I think Jesus said it best when he was talking on one occasion to a woman who at one point in her life had been filled with animosity towards the Jews. He said to her, look, salvation is of the Jews. <laughs> and by what he meant, what he meant by that is that there's, there's something about that nation and its history that holds the key uh, held the key for her salvation and does for us as well. And I, and I believe that that's the fact that the one who holds the keys to our salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ, and he came through, as I said before, that, um, that Jewish line. So to, to want the, uh, the destruction of Israel um, is actually to put the prospect of your own uh, salvation very much in peril. Um, God's purpose with that nation really stands firm, rock solid, uh, and it's a Jewish king that we rely on in faith for um, forgiveness and salvation. Shannon, uh, something to add to that question? Oh, let me ask you to unmute yourself, Shannon. Unmute button, don't hey. I? Um, James, I haven't got a lot more to add to that because I think actually Tash and uh, covered on quite a few of those points, as did um, Sid and the others. Um, but one thing I do want to just emphasise is the fact that we do have to remember how much media has a big play on this. Um, you know, media love scapegoats. They, they love to um, make a big performance out of something small. We only have to look at the big antics of the whole Trump scenario as to how they distorted things with the anti-vaxxers. The biggest voice always gets heard. And um, because we, our Western society is moving to very much towards atheism, uh, religion is seen as a scapegoat. So it is, you know, every opportunity the media gets to blame Christianity, they will. And um, I think we do have to put that in perspective when people say, particularly big atheistic voices, that religion causes everything. I mean, they didn't cause the whole Nazi situation. That was one of the biggest in world history and it was not caused by religion. What about Stalin? You've got Pol Pot, the three biggest in the world events of disasters, and none of them were caused by religion. Now, I'm not saying that religion isn't involved in the Middle East because it obviously is, but the reason that people went back in their mind to Jerusalem was not because of religion. 
Originally, the people that went back, Zionists or the uh, the people that were chased back because of their experiences of Auschwitz and things like that, they were majority of them were young atheists, and they weren't faithful. It was only the later people that came in and were brought in as refugees um, and were filling up the kibbutzes and working together that many of them later came in who were actually faithful. So it's very easy to distort um, the, our concept of history if we listen to media, and we do have to be really careful of that um, when we actually hear things on the news and take into account it's usually a lot more complicated than they actually presented. So I don't really have anything more to say on that because I think everybody's pretty much covered it well, James. Okay, thanks very much. Um, for our last section, um, bringing it a lot more to really what we're facing right now today and even here in Melbourne, um, this is about the response of believers um, to current events and local unrest like we have uh, here in Australia? What, what do people of faith do? How do we respond to these things? Um, and to that uh, end, the first uh, question, which I'll, I'll go to Tash on first and then maybe back to you, Shannon, is what is the appropriate response to Lebanese and Palestinians here in Melbourne who view Israel as racist and historically the aggressor? Um, you have all this knowledge, this history that you know, but these are people that really feel wronged and as a, they feel defensive of their people and uh, don't know all these things. What's the, what's the response of people of faith locally here in Melbourne uh, the, to talk through these things? Okay. An easy question for you, Tash. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, well, I think there's always benefit and wisdom in taking the approach of coming alongside the person. So to listen, to learn, to find common ground wherever possible and to try and see the world through their lens by hearing their story and by acknowledging the complexity. So modern day Israelis have their own worldview of the situation and how they act is how victors of war will typically react if they are poked and prodded, especially so when they have their own collective um, baggage of um, being terribly persecuted and being stateless for many generations themselves. It's very understandable. The Palestinians and the local Arabs have their own worldview of the same situation and they are acting how downtrodden people will typically react, especially if they feel that they are being oppressed and if they are without hope for their future and their children's future. Once again, it's very understandable. So the different sides in the mix here have different perspectives of who is right and who is wrong who is being reasonable, who is being unreasonable. And it's only by um, coming to terms with and acknowledging the different perspectives that we can come some way to truly appreciating and empathising about the complexity and understand why it is that the Middle East peace process has eluded um, the most eloquent and well-intended um, you know, leaders of our modern era. As individuals, we are perhaps unlikely to change the hard-held opinions of others, um, but that's okay. We can still practice what Jesus would do and we can lean on and further explore for ourselves New Testament teachings of um, inclusiveness and promises of peace and their incredible hope for a future that is um, of peace and free of war, not just for Jerusalem, but the entire world in God's promised kingdom. Shannon, any, uh, any comment on that? Anything to add? Um, I think Tash said it very well. It's really, really complex. And whenever you speak to anybody from Lebanon or something like that, you're just going to get hot anger. 
Um, you know, it's such a hot spot, this topic. I think it's really difficult to talk to anybody uh, with reason about it unless they've got a bit of distance. So that does make it really, really hard. I mean, how do you talk to people when they've got family and friends over there that are really impacted? by this situation. I mean, it is so complicated. You've got a large group of Jews there. There's about 9 million of them. There's a large number of, of, of them. And, um, you know, a good portion of them want to stay in there and have that homeland. I mean, imagine, um, I mean, the Hamas's charter. The Hamas's charter is not very nice. As you said, it's to kill. They have softened it, but it's basically they won't recognise Israel and they want to kill Israel. Um, so. From their perspective, they would like all the Jews to leave. Well, you imagine in our situation um, in Australia, if all the Aborigines, the Indigenous people said, okay, off, off you go, you go back to your own home. I mean, it is not possible. The Jews have no home to go to. That is their native homeland from ancient times. So they can't leave, just like me, you, can't just up, and go off to Europe or whatever, it's too complicated. And we've got the same situation in America with the American Indians, we've got the same situation in New Zealand with the Maoris. None of those situations are easy. As we've found with the Indigenous people and they've found with the American Indians, it's complex and it's difficult to sort these things out. So with that in mind, it is really, really challenging. And, we, you know, we're all black and white to a degree. We all see things through our perspective. And um, one of the things that I do like to talk about to people when they are pretty wound up and upset about this kind of thing, which you'd expect if you've got relatives over there, is that Israel is not being faithful. Uh, you know, from a Christian's perspective, they should be compassionate and loving their neighbours. And that is the scriptural Old Testament way. They were told to love the foreigners amongst them because they were foreigners in Egypt. And because of that, they are meant to be compassionate and understanding to their neighbours. Now, I do know they do try. It's not like it's uh, they don't try at all. But really they are an oppressor now. They were oppressed and they've lost that perspective and now they're oppressing. And I think if we come sometimes from that perspective, then people don't always feel like we're blaming. We're saying, hey, yeah, Israel should be doing better. Yep, Hamas also is guilty. You know, who's going to go and tell Hamas that they shouldn't be saying death to Jews? It's not a very nice thing to say. So they both should be able to do better. And I think if we can take that to the table, then hopefully we can reason with people a little bit and show that it's a little bit more complicated than what perhaps they thought. Thanks uh, for that, Shannon. Yeah, certainly an education process and uh, talking to your general person on the street, especially a non-Palestinian, uh, uh, especially in the younger generations, uh, often have a very strong opinion and very little knowledge. And hopefully the, tonight in our presentation can uh, facilitate some of that getting up to speed. Our very last question, um, it's a hopefully finishing with a positive one, and they can be short and sweet and, and to the point. Uh, everybody wants to see an end to all of this, um, and a few questions came into this effect. What is, last question, what is God's purpose with Israel with the recent activity in the Middle East, and what will the end of these things be? Is there any hope for a lasting peace process in the Middle East? Um, we'll go to Sid, uh, and then we'll finish with Josh. Um, Sid, would you like to offer some comments on that question? Yes, thanks, Jane. Just before, I was also going to mention that one of the other challenging issues in the Middle East is that the, the surrounding Arab nations made no attempt to resolve the Palestinian refugee problem as it developed, and we've been quite happy to let it sit there because it's another way of bringing pressure on, on Israel. I mean, they're all uh, fabricating wealthy nations who could have dealt with it but elected not to because it suits generally their purpose not to. And uh, it's interesting that some of them have now decided just to leave the Palestinians to their own uh, situation and develop these peace treaties with Israel. So uh, a lot of internal conflict there as well. In connection with the uh, God's purpose with Israel, clearly in the early stage it was to retain his word and be the custodians of that, and that understanding forms the basis of 
Christianity too. It's the underlying Judeo-Christian uh, ethic. And uh, without the Old Testament part, or the, they call the Torah, well, that section of it, uh, we sort of need that for the overall understanding of God's plan and purpose. He, ultimately, of course, his plan was to bring them back into the land to show his hand in that. And then it will lead into saving them ultimately from a, a tax that will come upon them in a, in a big way. Uh, in the interest of time, we won't go into the, into the quotes. I'll say that Ezekiel chapter 38 uh, clearly talks about a, a massive host coming down upon that area and being uh, beaten by the army or the power of God. And the effect of that, which is interesting, is specified in the following chapter, chapter 39 of Ezekiel, if we want to look at that, is, and God quotes, that the outcome of that will be that his holiness and his name will be vindicated when the nations of the world have to accept that he really was running the show, so to speak, and this massive military force that comes there is obviously going to be destroyed. That activity will usher in the return of Christ and the setting up of God's kingdom, as has been mentioned by various presenters. And uh, the key bit there in, in relation to the Middle East is that Jerusalem will be the centre of that. And uh, also that uh, we know that that was the centre of the gospel message where Christ preached from and, and uh, many of the Old Testament prophets uh, spoke of this coming kingdom as well. The kingdom will be one of peace and equity for all, no oppression, no lack for anyone. I guess uh, the prophet Isaiah has numerous references to that. We won't go to those. One way of perceiving it in reverse is to do something like uh, look at the uh, SBS World News at 6.30 where they do a spin around the crises of the world and you can just, it's appalling, and just go, well, the kingdom will be the reverse of that. Um and you know, there will be no, no oppression, no, lack, no one will lack. So that is the only hope for, for mankind and that's the, that which we established at the return of Christ that is the only way out because there's no, as has been mentioned, for a whole range of reasons by various uh, presenters, that uh, you, this Middle Eastern situation is unresolvable by, by man. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, look, uh, just... That phrase, um, lasting peace, just in terms of that phrase, I think there's something there I would just like to just sort of uh, pick up on. Um, yes, absolutely, there is hope. That's been alluded to uh, tonight. Um, but I think this is important. The big picture situation with the nations and the obvious need for peace in, in that context actually does call for a, a personal response on our part. But... It's a response that has less to do with solving those problems as such, and it's more about us personally responding to God's command to repent. Um, so we've been talking about the enmity that exists among the nations, um, but there's another enmity, uh, there's another hostility that um, the scriptures are at pains to highlight and ironically enough it's the enmity which mankind naturally has with his creator uh, the bible depicts man as being in a highly problematic situation uh, in that we sin uh, we disobey god we find ourselves estranged from him and we find ourselves on the path to inevitable and eternal death it's faith in that Jewish Messiah. It's faith in Jesus that delivers us from this situation of enmity with God. And the Bible describes that blessing of being forgiven of sins. And then it describes the condition of the person who accepts the blessing of Christ in their life. And it says that they are at peace with God. And the Bible goes on to say that it's those people who through faith in Jesus have peace with God, they therefore become the agents of that peace in the day when Jesus returns. So the Bible describes their, their personal hope as being uh, that of reigning with King Jesus as his assistants and involved in personally bringing about peace among the troubled nations that we see today. That, that's a marvellous hope. So there's a promise of personal peace if we respond to the gospel, but then there's the promise of being agents of that peace 
in the time when Jesus reigns on the earth. Uh, and that's going to be an amazing time. And there's so many scriptures we could we could go to, and, and uh, Sid's alluded to a couple of them. But remember, Jesus on one occasion taught his disciples to pray. And he said, this is, this is how you pray. He says, um, Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And it's in that day that that prayer ultimately is going to be fulfilled and what the angels announced at the birth of Jesus, peace on earth to men of goodwill, that that will become a reality. So there is hope for peace in this world. Ironically enough, even though it doesn't look like it at times, we're on that track that is going to lead inevitably and ultimately to that. And we've got the opportunity now as individuals to find peace with God through Jesus Christ. Well, thanks very much, uh, Josh, and to all of our four panelists for your time tonight. Uh, we got through a lot of content um, in a short amount of time. Um, thank you, Sid, for being the presenter. Um, and these two things will continue to be uh, available on our Canterbury website. And on behalf of the Canterbury uh, Church community, um, we would like to thank you for your attention, your contributions, your questions, and of course, to our Father in heaven and to our Lord Jesus for the grace to receive these things and to have the freedom uh, to have faith here in Australia and discuss these things openly. And we continue to pray for open uh, dialogue being permitted. Um, I'd like to note uh, that the recordings uh, of these are going to be not only on our website, but also on our YouTube channel, which many of you are probably on. And please keep an eye out on our website and our YouTube channel for notice of more upcoming events, uh, more Q&As and presentations on relevant topics. Um, this one tonight was a very complex and multi-layered topic. There is no chance we were going to cover it all tonight. So we would invite you to continue to ask questions, both on topics that came out of tonight's presentation, um, Q&A, as well as the original presentation, um, to questions at cce.org.au. And we want to continue to engage with you um, on those ideas. So thank you for coming. Um, our goal as a small uh, church community is to um, help the believer think and the thinker believe and connecting both the head and the heart as we serve our community with our hands and our voices. Um, in these great times of confusion, uh, during a time when faith is under fire and truth is a precious rarity and love is so desperately needed, we pray that we can be a beacon of light and hope for you all. Thank you for tonight and God bless. <laughs>